Can everyone hear me? Yes. Sir. Um, I, I see a bunch of familiar faces in the room, including Alan and Sarah, so I know that some of you will have heard some of what I'm thinking I'm going to say today before, and if I see the eyes start to glaze over, then I'll know it's time to move on to a new subject. Here are my notes, um, and the reason I say that is that I'm very comfortable having this be very informal. I, I wasn't here for the morning. I think I have a bit of a sense of what you all talked about this morning, but if you think I'm veering off from where I should be, just give me some sort of sign and we'll get back on track. And I guess the final introductory point I would make is um, that please interrupt with questions or comments as far as I'm concerned. Is that all right with you, Marty? And maybe I'll talk, we haven't even coordinated between ourselves, this is how it's all this. <laughs> yeah, that will be fine. Um, but maybe I'll just talk for a few minutes about the whole Access to Justice Commission initiative, etc. Marnie is uh, in charge, as you've just heard, of the state law libraries, the trial court law libraries. And she's got some incredible people and incredible resources available that you'll want to know about if you don't already. But I thought I would try to sort of set the larger context, um, and I could get really large if, if you permit me, but um, the, the sort of starting point for what I'm going to talk about is this very basic principle that I articulate to myself at least as follows, and it is that um, the rule of law is really not available for anyone if it's not available for everyone. And what I mean by that I think it's pretty self-evident. If it doesn't, if, if we all can't have confidence that our system of law works for everyone, then it really doesn't work for anyone. Because there's always a chance that that other person is going to be somebody that you're bumping into. Um, so the, the, the question is how to ensure that our, our justice system, however you define that, and we could spend weeks just talking about that question, um, that our justice system is equally accessible to everybody who needs access to it. Uh, Massachusetts historically, this is my take, and, I, and you should know that um, I practiced in Massachusetts for uh, 15 years before I became a judge about 10 years ago. So that's how long I've been uh, bouncing off of the justice system in Massachusetts. And my sense is that we've done a good job, a real good job, in Massachusetts at a kind of ad hoc level of keeping this notion in mind and ensuring that we have to make our justice system accessible, but that it has been fairly ad hoc for a long time. That started to change, I think, about five plus years ago with the establishment of something called the Access to Justice Commission under the auspices of the Supreme Judicial Court. Before I go any further, let me explain that I think what you all talked about some this morning is sort of how to access the theory of the law. And what I think uh, I'm, I'm more going to talk about is how you access the process of the law or the procedures that are necessary uh, for the rule of law to, to, to sort of galvanize the rule of law for yourself. Or, um, so Access to Justice Commission was created under the auspices of the Supreme Judicial Court about uh, five plus years ago. That is, uh, th there's been a sort of national trend to do this, and so we were by far not the first state to do it. There are probably at this point about 35 or more Access to Justice Commissions around the country. and. Typically, the role of those commissions is to see the justice system writ large from 30,000 feet, for lack of a better metaphor, to, to look down at the, a system that's comprised of uh, the courts, the legal services community, the private bar, academia, social service agencies, executive branch agencies, and to see how they are all interacting with one another so as to ensure that this system in its entirety is, a, is as accessible as possible. Uh, we decided, I, I was very privileged to serve on the Access to Justice Commission from, the, from its inception, and the first thing we decided to do was to go around the state and convene a series of um, hearings, four public hearings around the state, with panels of sort of 
all sorts of people, judges, other court employees, regular people, lawyers, to ask this question of what are the barriers to access to justice in Massachusetts, and what ideas do you all have about how to reduce those barriers. So we did a series of those hearings, we issued a series of reports, um, and uh, a number of the reports recommended that in order to make the trial courts themselves more accessible, it would be important to have an office within the trial court focused specifically on access to justice. So finally that happened a year ago this week, actually, and uh, I was very honored to be appointed as special advisor to the trial court for that purpose. And I work with a woman named Sandy Lundy, who's a senior lawyer at the SJC, Supreme Judicial Court, and she's the deputy advisor. Um, so I'm going to tell you now quickly what we've been sort of looking at for the last year and what we're trying to do. And then maybe I'll bounce it over to Marnie and back to you, and we'll see where this all goes. Uh, we thought that we had a sort of sense from the hearings that were done by the Access to Justice Commission and from the reports of various other committees that have looked at the needs, in particular, of self-represented litigants, I think more often more accurately described as unrepresented litigants. Um, I actually think there's a difference between self-represented and unrepresented litigants, and we see both of them. Incidentally, eight out of 10 litigants in my court are self-represented. So that's the reality that we're looking at. Um, but we thought we, we um, had a sense of what the sort of critical needs were. But to check that, we did a couple of things. We just talked to everybody that we knew to talk to sort of over last summer. And then in the fall, we rolled out an electronic survey of all of our trial court employees to ask them, what do you have in your workplace, in your, at your court, under these various categories of things that enhance access to justice, like advocates and technology and uh, multilingual staff, et cetera. What do you have in your workplace? And using that same list, what do you need that you don't have? And that very simple instrument allowed us to gather and then chart the data documenting the disconnect between what people, at least working within the court, and obviously this is a specific perspective, uh, but the data um, of at least what people working within the court think we need most and have least. And not surprisingly, although interestingly, in terms of its unanimity and uncontrovertibility, if that's a word, um, everyone across the trial court, judges, clerks, probation, clerical people, everybody across our seven trial court departments and across the state, everyone's responses coalesced around just a few areas. Uh, the, the, Overwhelming consensus was that we needed services for self-represented litigants. We needed self-help centers in courthouses. We needed self-help materials. Uh, we needed everything to help people who were trying to access the courts on their own. That's one thing. A second thing was we needed everything having to do with, multi, with, with language services. More interpreters, more interpreters outside of the courtroom. We probably do a pretty good job of getting people interpreters for their courtroom proceedings, but something like 90% of what goes on in a courthouse does not happen in a courtroom. It happens in a hallway, at a clerk's office, at a probation office. We need more interpreters for those um, interactions. We need more multilingual staff. We need more multilingual forms. I mean, with very few exceptions, all our forms, all our court forms are in English. So one anecdote I heard from someone, for example, is a probation officer who has to spend an hour of her time uh, working with a Spanish-speaking, uh, what are they called, probationee, probationer, probation, okay. um, translating a form from English to Spanish so that he can complete it rather than just having that form in Spanish so she can do her work for an hour. So uh, multilingual forms, multilingual self-help materials, multilingual staff, everything having to do with language services. And then the third, and this is where this might be of particular interest to you, 
is everything having to do with technology. Um, we don't have internet access in most of our courthouses. It's a big problem for employees, it's a big problem for lawyers, and it's not just that folks want to be shopping at L.L. Bean, it's that, um, you know, so much of what we need now to do our jobs is uh, available efficiently over the internet, and if we don't have internet access, that's a big problem. We also don't have the capacity, with some limited exceptions, to engage court transactions uh, remotely online. We don't have multimedia resources in large part. So that if we have a self-help pamphlet that's not very helpful to an illiterate litigant, and we have many of them, not just not English speaking, but illiterate even in their native languages, we don't have the audio and the video counterpart that would be useful for that person. So those, um, that little survey, which I, I, people have heard me say this before, I know, but I joke that Sandy and I did this on the professional equivalent of a cocktail napkin. You know how you sketch out your addition for your house or your landscaping plan on the napkin? That's really, we just wrote out this, in, this uh, instrument, very simple, but it really helped us to chart the path for what we're going to do, what we are doing and, and are going to do. Uh, moving forward. And so here's what we're doing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Marty or open it up for questions as you prefer. Um, we are focused on five projects, and we're at different stages of them, but they're all moving forward. I'm, I'm very pleased to report. Uh, one is that we have completed the work that was started by Marty and others of uh, developing a manual by and for the staff of our clerk offices, our clerk offices, uh, to delineate this uh, tricky question of the difference between legal information, which we in the courts are, and you in libraries, et cetera, are encouraged and probably uh, obligated to provide, and legal advice, which is this thing we're absolutely not supposed to provide. And I don't say that facetiously, that's true. But a lot of our court staff, we have found, are more conservative than they need to be, more cautious than they need to be about that line, and they do it of uh, a a um, they do it out of an impulse to make sure that they're not doing something wrong. So that's to be commended. But what we came to understand is that if we could reassure them about where that line is and how they can be on the right side of it and still be helpful, that they really wanted that sort of guidance. So we have completed a manual on that and we're rolling out a series of uh, training sessions around it for our court staff starting in the fall. The second thing we're doing is we're rolling out something called LAR, Limited Assistance Representation, sometimes known as Limited Scope Representation or Unbundling. And that's the notion that a lawyer and a client can enter into a relationship for limited assistance. The lawyer doesn't have to take on the client's entire case lawyer can agree, for instance, to do a just a pretrial conference in the divorce or just a mediation in the eviction case and thereby make more lawyers available to more litigants than is the case if either on a pro bono or fee-for-service basis the lawyer has an open-ended commitment. LAR, limited assistance representation, is now fully operational in the probated family court in Massachusetts. It's just been picked up by the Boston Municipal Court for civil cases. It's about to be picked up by the District Court for civil cases and the Housing Court. So we're, we're trying to roll that out and promote it and market it um, as, a, as a tool, both pro bono and fee for service. Uh, quickly, the three other things we're doing is we're piloting um, an information center at the Brook Courthouse for self-help materials to try to take some of the confusion and demand that presents at the clerk's offices or in the courtrooms and deflect that to a place where there are resources available to deal with it and thereby take the burden off our incredibly overburdened staff and make sure that once things get to a courtroom they've been organized in a way that the courtroom can respond to. And then we're working on forms, making them uniform, big, big project. Uh, simple, multilingual, 
multimedia, capable of being completed online, and the same for self-help materials. So that's what we're doing. And, and um, that is all under the auspices of what we call the Access to Justice Initiative, which is a trial court-based office in Massachusetts. And is separate then, although obviously interconnected to, the Access to Justice Commission, which is this thing that has the 30,000 view, view of the entire justice system. And through that commission, we hope to reach out to many people like yourselves to help us with resources that we need within the courts and outside the courts to um, sort of fulfill some of these goals that we laid out for ourselves. Okay? All right. <laughs> So, shall I turn it over to Marty? I need your hand. Precious stuff. Right? represent the simple people, and given that it's got a whole new meaning <laughs> as of today. Um, when I started in my career at Goodwin Proctor, it, like Joan said this morning, there was no mass code of regulations. Uh, you received different print ones. The good news was that the uh, state bookstore at least would put them together for you in a box. So you got a box like this that you went through and you tried to figure out how to organize it. and. Um, we never had them all. We didn't know what was there or not there. But as mentioned this morning, in 1976, the first edition of the CMR was published. It was blue in about 20 volumes. And then the second edition came along, and it was 25 volumes. And the binders are getting thicker. And now you can't even fit everything in the binder, so you bring in your own binder. All of which is to make the point that we are in a regulated society and I do not see that trend changing. It's like something goes wrong and what are we going to do? We're going to make more regulations. So somehow, as Joan said this morning, we've got to make it accessible to people about how they can follow the laws. So I thought for reality testing, I asked a couple of my staff members on for Monday and Tuesday. Remember we do... Um, referenced by internet, um, well, by instant messaging, email, in person, and phone. So I don't know how these all came in. But I asked them to keep their questions and what did people ask for? So, um, and this is the list. It is not exhaustive. You didn't need to be here. Many of you who are librarians do this every day. This is more for the non librarians so that you know what we do. So here are the questions that are coming in to us Does a restroom have to have a bathroom? Wait, does a restroom? No, restroom. Restroom. Thank you. Well, that's the kind of question I get in my school. <laughs> <laughs> does getting a ticket for tinted windows, which I've now removed, mean my car insurance premiums will go up? By the way, the CMR answers that. Um, does my employer have to pay me when I report to jury duty? My friend was charged with this crime. The good news is they had the site to it, so at least we can look that up. Can you tell me what it is? And it turned out it was criminal harassment. <laughs> Do you have the case study on Kaplan versus Donovan? This person had been referred to this case by someone who wanted to read it. It's about a temporary emergency custody of a child to a parent fleeing to Massachusetts from another state to avoid an allegedly abusive situation. So we didn't get to why that person really needed it, but we understood what the case was that they wanted. And from this morning, I do want to say, I wasn't going to read this one, but I think it gets into the complexity of what we're doing. For state tax person, somebody needed to have the definition of a salesman. Now this is what they had to look up to kind of get the answer. They used the 1954 Internal Revenue Code, some other regulations from the 1950s, the Senate Finance Committee report from 1954, because Massachusetts uses that as their definition. So you got to go to the federal to figure out what we use. And they also had to use the mass laws, regs, TRIs, to be honest, I don't even know what a TRI is. Um, letter rulings, directives relating to the definition of salesman or salesperson from 1975 to 1988. Now this was a tax question. I mean, and just think of what they did for that one question. So my other questions are, I love this one, 
My ex took out a restraining order on me. Do you know where I can read the law? I want to know section and verse. <laughs> <laughs> this came in written. I want a statute like the Statue of Liberty on limitations on suing someone for slander and defamation. Can you send me an unpublished, unreported case? And we turned out it was from a secondary source and we were able to do it. Now one of the other fun ones that come, comes in, and one of the things that I think we still haven't done strongly enough is access to past laws. Um, one of the answers to the question was, and it was over the internet, so we made it simple. It looks like the 1995 change only changed the words in the first paragraph from 65 years to 60 years. So if you change it back to 65 years, you should have the 1982 law. <laughs> you know, because you could do the history and work with what you've got in front of us. But we can't find necessarily the 1995 laws as they existed, or the 1982. We can figure out how to meander it back and forth. But to be honest, snapshots of the laws now and then would be very helpful. And at least we'd only have to do one more, one point. We still have to probably massage a little bit, but do that. So I guess the point of this, and mine was really to be sure, was to bring you up to some reality, is that people really don't know that they need the law until something comes up in their lives. And so I want the uprising that you have from the, from the grassroots. But the fact of the matter is, in my mind, that it's the people in this room that even understand what the problem is that have to be those grassroots. Because my patrons walking in are not even going to be thinking of this until they're asking for what does the restraining order mean. You know, they're, they're hoping never to have to have a restraining order. Now they need it. And so I really do want to say that I'm invested in this. I, you know, I've done a whole career on access to the law, and this is sort of where I feel like it's going to end, is to try to finish the job that many of us have been working on for years, um, hopefully before I, it's not going to be done before I retire, but maybe <laughs> before I go to my own funeral. So I really want to say that all of us who are here, I'm hoping we're here for all different reasons, but that all of us take on some commitment to take a piece of this, because the general public doesn't understand it. And it's up to us to make it understandable and happen. So that's my reality piece. Um, do you, can you access your website? Meg is actually going to do that. Oh, OK, yeah. great. That's coming up. But before, before you do, we, uh, Sandy Lundy, the deputy advisor, and I decided early on in our work about a year ago that we, our motto for this initiative was going to be, who knew? <laughs> because uh, we just kept discovering things that we realized we should have known but didn't. Uh, for instance, I knew very little about Marnie's trial court law library website. Look at Meg, don't look at me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. Uh, and uh, including the fact that available through the trial court law library website is a computer guided, now there's some problems with it, but there's a computer guided interview program that enables and facilitates a tenant in answering a summary process in eviction case. I'm a housing court judge and I didn't know that that existed on our own trial court law library website. So, and we just kept stumbling across that sort of thing. And so when I sort of get together with a group like this and I see that there are people from the executive branch here and people from other aspects of our society, I, I think that phenomenon just is multiplied millions fold in terms of what we don't know about what's already out there to help the people we're all trying to help, um, how to access each other's resources. I don't know what the answer to this is. I mean, we were having, we were chatting before the session started about the fact that we all tend to operate in our own little universes. I think. An important thing is to make sure that we all know that, that our universe is not the universe and that there are universes beyond ours. Uh, but, and as I say, I don't know what the answer is. I do think that gatherings like this that just at least start the process of communicating some information across these silos or universes that we all operate in is a good thing. But it would be great if there was somebody way, way, way up here that could just sort of you know, point every, all of us in the right direction when we needed stuff that's already out there that we don't know about. So, 
Would this be a good time to show the... Well, I don't know. Do, do people have any questions yeah. about it? Sure. I, I actually have a question. When you were talking about your five goals for access to justice, and the last two, one was forms, and the other was, I think, self-help materials. Do you have any timetable for, for those things? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yes and no is the, is the real answer. Uh, the, the task forces that are working on those particular projects are actively meeting, they're starting their work, and um, the sort of overarching no, uh, principle is don't wait to be able to do everything before you do anything. Mm -hmm. Start. And in, in, in that vein, uh, Phil Malone and I and some others are working on, we've just worked on a, um, a letter of support for a technology innovation grant that is being processed by some legal services programs here in Massachusetts. That are just, would it be interesting, Phil, do you think I should talk about A to J author and all that? I think a quick question that, because that's a great way to make okay. the legal okay. process available okay. to, to great. everyone. So I'll talk about this for a minute. That's all right, very good. So, there are four legal services programs that have come together in Massachusetts and applied for a technology innovation grant from the Legal Services Corporation. And the trial court has um, agreed to be a grant partner, assuming the grant is awarded, and we're hopeful that it will be. And we've written a letter of support for this grant, and Phil Malone and um, his crew at the Berkman have been very helpful both at providing their own support for the grant application and helping us understand, us the trial court understand, what it means for us to support this application. So this project is about, um, in a big way, trying to take the legal services website, masslegalhelp.org, and convert it into a real virtual self-help center where people can really find everything that they need to engage legal services and access the court system. One um, big piece of that would be to use a program, I think is the right word, called A to J Author, which was developed by Mr. Stout at University of Illinois Kent Law School. If I got that right? Uh, Chicago Kent Law School. Chicago Kent Law School, sorry. Um, this, this gentleman, Chicago Kent Law School, did this study back a few years ago. I think I've got this right, and you all Google it, and you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong about it, but uh, did a, a, a white paper, essentially, on how to leverage law students. That's what it's called, leveraging law students to promote access to justice. And so they looked at the various ways in which law students could be used to enhance access to justice from serving as advocates, to providing research, and what they ended up thinking was that the best use of at least tech-savvy law students was to use them to develop this A to J author program, which is used to, as I understand it, used by legal services programs and courts to design interviews, computer-guided interviews for self-represented litigants whereby the litigant uh, goes through the interview, very simple, very simple interface, very straightforward, very problem-oriented, not legalistic, etc. And in answering the questions that are put to her, uh, the, the, there's a, is actually filling in fields in a pleading. So if the question is, what's your problem? I'm being evicted. Unbeknownst to her, that's then triggering this whole logic thing that takes her down the eviction path so that she can end up with a completed answer to an eviction case. So A to J author is the tool that's used to design the content and I think the, the reality of these interviews, these computer guided interviews. This TIG grant, Technology Innovation Grant, would be uh, used to develop a, a, a series of those A to J author guided interviews to be used online to produce court forms. 
that was a very long answer to your question about court forms. So that if that if that grant comes through, uh, first of all, we'll know in the fall. Money will start to flow in January 11, and we've identified a series of forms that we would like to start with. Those being forms that are have multi-department use in the trial court, so we can get a lot of bang for the buck, and also um, are most commonly used by self-represented litigants. An affidavit of indigency, for instance, is how indigent folks tend uh, to initiate their civil cases so they don't have to pay a filing fee. It would be, and they're used in all the court departments. So um, that, an abuse prevention petition, a, a petition for restraining order in a domestic violence situation, those are used in several of our court departments. And the idea would be, um, that ultimately there would be an e-filing piece to this so that, and to, to use the example that we were talking about before the session of uh, someone who's the victim of domestic violence who lives way out in the hinterlands where, you know, far remote from a district court or a family court for instance, if she could go into a public library or a domestic violence shelter or somewhere with the assistance of a social worker or a librarian complete this interview uh, that would produce a petition for a restraining order that could then be e-filed to her district court. Um, or when, when we judges who do round-the-clock um, emergency response after hours and on weekends, when we get the call from the police at 3 o'clock in the morning and we're handling this request for a restraining order in the middle of the night, it would be so great if we could be actually looking at our own laptops at the petition that she's filed and then hit send and it goes to the district court where she needs to show up in the morning and back to the police department when an order is issued. That's the idea. That's the vision. I mean, it's, the vision's getting pretty large, but that's, that's the idea. So the, the um, I guess the short answer to your question is that we're working on things already we're, going, we're letting the, our access to resources guide our priorities a little bit. Uh, there's no money you may have heard. <laughs> and, and I can do a follow-up because I'm co-chairing the uh, self-help materials task force. And actually, you could all be very helpful. Again, on the who knew, um, there are actually quite a few print resources out there that different courts have done on their own. Are we unified? <laughs> Absolutely not. So what we've decided to do is to try to collect what we think are the best of these. And to be honest, we don't even know what the best is. We're going to know it when we see it. You know, we've got some criteria, but we'll do that. With the hope that at least even getting them up on the intranet, meaning the internal side and the internet, so that other courts who haven't even gotten this far would move in this direction. Obviously, I think in the end, we would like to have them uniform and make sure that they all meet, you know, fourth grade reading levels and all these other things that would be helpful, but that's what we're hoping to do, I think, within the next six months to a year. But you can all be helpful because it would be good to know what you need. I mean, we're, we're working on the task force. It's, it's, we have legal services people and we've got people from the courts, but if any of you can consistently, again, we're going for the biggest bang for our buck, but if there's some topic or something that you need that's over and over comes up, one, let me know, don't develop it, because we may already have it, or at least we could just change something, but it would be helpful to have your perspective in all of this too, because I think the more perspectives we bring to this place, the better we'll write them or make them responsive um, for people who need them. And, you know, the hope is, like, especially for you as librarians, you know, that when the person comes to you, we don't keep shuffling them around. Let, you know, if somebody comes to the state library and for some reason they can't answer the question, pick up the phone and call a trial court library. Don't send them to Woolver. Let's try to solve the issue where the person is if we have a chance. It doesn't always work, but let's try it if we can do that. Other questions or comments? Um, I heard that 50% uh, of applicants to the Legal Services Corporation are turned down. And actually, when I talked to Professor Tribe's um, staff at the Department of Justice, he says that's an underestimate because what happens is on a Tuesday, 
they know that they're full, they just stop taking applicants. I've also heard that 80% of the needs of the legal needs of the poor are unmet. Uh, these are national figures. Does is, is that reflect Massachusetts? And is there a difference between, let's say, Boston and the rural areas and, and the other cities? Do you, do you have to... I, I would say they're, they reflect what we are. Uh, I don't know about the urban. Yeah. And the yeah. urban sense they have, they have legal services and stuff, too. So there's like a, I would say suburbia probably is the best. And then you've got similar problems, rural and urban. But. I, um, I think those data are relatively applicable to Massachusetts. Uh, certainly there's enormous unmet need, just um, enormous, some of which we know about and some of which we don't know about. But as a judge who sits in Western Mass, <laughs> I also think it's fair to say that uh, there, it, there are more resources in Boston than there are outside of Boston. And I'll give you an example. Um, we in the housing, so that there are seven trial court departments in Massachusetts. The housing court department is one of them. And there are five divisions of the housing court around the state. Um, each of the divisions has a lawyer for the day program, which is a pro bono program where uh, lawyers come and represent people under a standing order that allows them to just do a limited piece of the work if that's what they choose to do. So we have one in my court in Western Mass, but there are weeks when I get the email from the Bar Association saying, sorry, we, we couldn't get a volunteer for this group. I came to Boston with one of the women who runs that program to just watch how the Boston Lawyer for a Day program operates in the housing court, and there was like an embarrassment of riches. I mean, first of all, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau was there en masse, it looked like. Um, <laughs> and so lawyers and law students. And then in Boston, big firms pick up a month. They'll say, we'll do every Thursday for a month. Goodwin Proctor will do every, you know. Um, and so there were literally more volunteers than there were people who wanted to use them in Boston. There, were, there was this room full of, of people uh, sitting, waiting for mediation. And one of the volunteer lawyers walked into the room and said, does anyone want free legal assistance with your mediation? And no one said yes. And I'm like, um, so, but, so that, that makes two points. One is the disparity. And uh, we're having something we, we've called a pro bono summit in Springfield on Monday where I'm trying to generate more volunteer help for our Lawyer Per Day program. But, but also, um, and it was Esme who I think was the one who said, well, if I'm, if I'm here in Boston uh, on a Thursday and I'm not needed, then someone from Springfield could maybe IM me or you know, do, I could maybe help someone remotely if the technology existed to make that possible. So, that's another thing that we should all be sort of thinking and talking about is how to level the, how to, how to achieve parity across the state without having to move bodies to use sort of virtual assistance to try to level the playing field a little bit. And another sort of side answer to what you brought up is in what, 2004, 2005, um, the trial court law libraries did something called Navigating the Legal Maze, where we pulled together in a group. Um, well, the first year was concentrated on legal services kind of organizations really loosely, and the second year was on social services, with the idea that when people have to say, turn somebody down, is there another place that's appropriate for them to refer them to that might be able to take them. I mean, it depends on what the issue is. Sometimes they don't need legal services. You know, they need the tenancy preservation, you know. Um, and so we really try to um, get people referring. And it worked for a while, but people change. And I will say, in, um, here in Nevada, one of the county law libraries in Nevada has a <coughs> website where they have all their social services, legal services there, and even in pictures. So the problem is money, you put on the money bag. You're mm -hmm. housing, there's a little house. But it pulls up by county and city or whatever what the resources are. Because I think we do turn people down, but I also think we don't get them to the person who actually 
might be able to help them. And I don't quite know how to get from point A to B, other than I think Nevada, at least web-wise, has done the best job of organizing the content to at least allow anybody, whether you're legal services or librarian, somebody in court to say, okay, what's really available right here for the issue? In Minnesota, Minnesota also has an incredible self-help infrastructure in its court um, system. And we just learned a little bit about um, what they have out at the Equal Justice Conference in Arizona in May. They have this capacity. You know how when you have a problem with your computer and you call your IT thing, they come on your computer with you, you see the little thing. and Well, they can do that with litigants um, to, who are trying to fill out forms. So a litigant is at a public access terminal and calls a remote number, and the person on the other end can get on the computer with her and ask her questions and help her fill out that form, even though there's not a person standing in front of her to do it. So leveraging technology is just a huge opportunity and challenge. And what else? So a quick observation based on, on the last few bits of discussion in our, our chat beforehand. It, it really does seem in, in keeping with the general idea of what I've got to make all primary legal materials available, openly available online, combined with trying to bring together all these different sources of help and ability to file and ability to access the legal system. The more that we can somehow bring those all either into one place, whether it's law libraries or uh, kind of broad or legal websites in some way so that people seeking legal help can access lots of different pieces and at least figure out what's there. It's the, you, know, you don't know what you don't know and that who knew phenomenon mm -hmm. you described. But the more that we can somehow bring those together in really simple websites that help people you know, quickly get channeled to what they want, but not just get to statutes, not just get to court decisions, but maybe yeah. get to legal aid groups, or maybe right. get to the court's own set of forms or the court's own self-help materials. That seems like a fabulous you know, holy grail to shoot for where you can kind of find it all in one place and easily navigate it to get to whichever piece of it you need. And a couple of things about that. First of all, obviously that kind of resource needs to be problem based, not technical, not, you know, people need to be able to say, I'm having this problem. I don't know what you call it. I don't even know what court I go to about it, but here's my problem. And that should be, it seems to me, the entry point to this network. But also, uh, given the reality, uh, two other points. There are a huge percentage, and I just want to put this out there and be honest about it. There's a big percentage, and I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a big percentage of self-represented litigant that's not going to be able to use even a simple tool like that. So a secondary benefit of a tool like that is that it leverages advocates, too. So now the, 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 lay ad, the lay but sophisticated advocate, whether it be the person at the shelter or at the Department of Transitional Assistance or whatever, she knows how to use that tool. So if what we're dealing with is a litigant who couldn't use it himself, but he can get the assistance of someone at a social service agency, et cetera, then that just sort of leverages the, and increases the pool of advocates that are available to help. Um, and then the final point I'll make is, because we, you know, just even listening, watching that and listening to the questions that came in at the law libraries, some of those are once a year questions, once a lifetime questions. Um, what we obviously don't need to do is design a system that takes care of that, those sorts of things, I don't think. I think we need to take care of the, uh, the questions we get over and over, the cases we get over and over. 60% of our translation services in Massachusetts are used for Spanish-speaking people in district court. So that tells us something about where we want to put some resources in terms of translating forms and selling out materials. Probably first into Spanish for forms that are used in district court. And so I think when we talk about this one-stop shopping, uh, it's not realistic to think that we could cover every legal need, right. every piece of legal effort, but we could certainly uh, deal with the things that come up over and over. And my summary piece on that would be that 
The American Library Association is very close. Almost every public library has internet access, and so it, to overlook the idea that public libraries are sitting in almost every community or county or whatever, however you're organized throughout the country, is to overlook a huge resource. Um, and again, librarians are very different in terms of their skill level, but they know enough to pick up the phone and call somebody to say, I don't know, help me out. And that's, you know, so, so they're at the Palmer Public Library and calling Springfield. We can work with them that way, too. Good. So, quick question. So, um, I know when reports started bringing up uh, wanting to put their records online, all these issues of privacy came up in the text capacity you needed to deal with those issues and some courts like went ahead and they found out they made mistakes and scaled up. Is all that stuff kind of like worked out now in Massachusetts? No. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> is that kind of like adding to the money and all the yeah. logistical problems? Um, I don't know everything yeah. there is to know about that yeah. by a long shot. What we, are, we are in the process in the Massachusetts state courts of rolling out a uniform case management system. That's a really good thing. Uh, it turns out that having a uniform case management system is necessary, you'll understand this way more than I do, but is necessary in order to be able to have use certain tools like e-filing. So we've got this case management system in place in five of our seven trial court departments, and within a year or so we hope to be fully integrated. But it, it, of course, you won't be surprised to hear, um, doesn't work exactly the way uh, it's supposed to all the time, and it, uh, there are problems at all. But also, this whole what information can we show on public pages is definitely, uh, the SJC just recently issued something, I forget what it's called. Yes, they did. It's a guideline or something on how to protect private information and all of that. So uh, when we're starting to pull together the threads of that problem, but I don't know that we've solved it. Let's get the cases first. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.